Okay, everyone, welcome back. So we have another sponsor user update. Uh, this is one of our newest sponsors to the VM Workshop, uh, VChain. So with us today, we have uh, Dennis Zimmer to give us an update on, on VChain and what they're doing. So Dennis, over to you. Thank you very much, glad you're having me. Um, I'm uh, Dennis Zimmer, co-founder and CTO of VChain. Um, I co-founded the company together with Moshe Bar, and um, we are providing trust and integrity solutions uh, with a focus on immutable storage. So storing immutable data, immutable uh, info, or storing important information and sensitive information in an immutable way. Uh, and um, we provide several solutions for it. And one of our uh, latest uh, solutions and that is also open source and uh, is very or received very well is ImmuDB. And uh, over the next minutes, I'm going to focus on ImmuDB. Um, as I had mentioned, if there are any questions uh, in between, please feel free. Uh, I'm going to uh, walk through a couple of slides, but a few ones, and then I'm showing some uh, demos, how you could actually use uh, ImmuDB, um, how it's also uh, running on Ubuntu on ZOS, and um, how we, for example, uh, use it in, in a real um, use cases and actually our customers are also using it. Seconds. You can see my screen, I assume? Uh, yes, we can. Looks good. Yeah. So our goal when we created ImmuDB was always about uh, ease to set up and simplicity. Um, and of course, when it comes to immutable solutions and also uh, distributed ledger solutions or uh, ledger technologies in general, a lot of them are either pretty hard to set up, um, they are also extremely hard to maintain. Um, and of course, there are uh, no, no such things like a backup and restore and archive uh, is uh, it's coming for any typical database um, or data structure. And we wanted to come up with a solution that is first of all, extremely fast. Uh, so that you can also use it to guarantee immutability for traditional databases. So support, uh, for example, to have a temper-proof uh, history of fields in a MongoDB or in a uh, Postgres or in a DB2 or whatever kind of databases you are using. Uh, so it needs to be extremely fast that you don't slow down your existing applications um, because you want to have immutable fields. Uh, then, of course, it needs to be uh, a temper proof, so it should automatically pop up uh, a note on, and uh, alert you when somebody either tempered the data structure in general, so more of a brute force, uh, or a certain uh, field, uh, so it's a key value store right now. Uh, we are currently working on having a, a more um, transactional data structure on top of well as well. And it should be able to run in a very small setup. Uh, so it's not a big database that you actually, uh, like a, a blockchain uh, typically is, uh, where you have uh, dozens or hundreds of applications that are using it. It's also meant uh, to be contained in a, in a stack, for example. So you can have it in a small stack and uh, it's very, uh, has a very small footprint and extremely fast to set up. Uh, it's also on the Apache 2 license. So it's an open source project, so nobody is uh, blocked by uh, using it. Um, and we released the, the first version in uh, May 2020, so not so far uh, uh, in the past, uh, but we became pretty quick uh, trending and actually we saw great success on the community adoption. Uh, the community actually uh, also contributed pretty fast to the project. So we noticed that there is a need and uh, people really like to have also work with uh, uh, the structure and the data structure we came up with. Uh, to give you a little bit of an architectural overview before I go into the demo, um, the ImmuDB has certain components. Uh, some components are more to store the data and other components are to make sure that the data is not tempered and nobody could actually uh, change data he was not intended to change. Or actually, in our case, the uh, ImmuDB storage is append-only storage, so nothing can be deleted. Um, but we also have a Merkle tree on top of it, and this Merkle tree um, makes it cryptographically proof uh, that you can't change any value, and especially without changing the history of a value. 
And to uh, guarantee that, we don't rely on the ImmediB uh, just itself as a storage. We also rely on certain clients. So our idea here is that the client can automatically verify is the data that he is receiving, for example, or um, before putting any new data uh, into the database. There is always a way to double check if the existing data has been tampered or not. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, there are two ways the brute force one, so somebody really gained access to the host uh, or the system the ImmediB is running on uh, and changes the files physically. That is actually detected already on the ImmediB system itself, and it just stops and gets read only and alerts you. But there's also then the logic tempering. So somebody would temper uh, or overwrite some of the, uh, the values. And in this case, it's not possible to overwrite any existing value, but you can, of course, append new values. And the client makes it possible that you can always verify if your application is the owner of the last value that has been written, or if uh, the whole data is consistent from a logical perspective, so you as an application or as a client, um, or if somebody else started to uh, change data, for example, uh, used your password or used your, um, your credentials to access the, the database. But there's a, uh, next to the normal authentication part, there's also the Merkle tree on top where you can also verify what has been written by your application specifically. And what I'm going to show you is uh, the, the typical simple setup, let's say like this. So I'm here on a, on a Ubuntu on a, an S390. And I've already downloaded the binaries of uh, ImmediB. So there's the ImmediB as a server part, and then there's the ImmediB Immu client. Uh, so it's just a CLI where I can already uh, set and, and get values from it. So you can download it also on our uh, ImmediB uh, GitHub repository, or there are also already pre-built um, binaries for it. And if I'm going to start it here, so I'm just starting it now without authentication, and it's easier. Oh, sorry. So now it's running in the background, and I can actually start to write data into it. So I just like a simple value. Oh, sorry, I should also say that I want to set something. And what we have already built in are commands, and of course you can also use an API for it, that there is a check before getting actually into the database. And this is actually now on purpose. So when you set a data, um, but you get the data, it, the client always verifies if actually the data is valid or not. And if the data, in this case, somebody, for example, changed the uh, ImmediB, or uh, I created another ImmediB, so a, a second uh, ImmediB process that runs on the same data, so I'm, I'm more or less tampering by replacing the binary, the client can automatically detect something has been changed or not. And further down the demo, I'm going to show you, of course, how it looks like uh, when the data has not been tempered. But here you see that we already have integrated solutions, also with a safe, safe get, integrated solutions that automatically check if data has been tempered. Oh, sorry. And this uh, root index, that is the, the main important point. This is actually the Merkle tree that we put on top, and that is how we make sure if data is immutable or not. Looking into a, a running infrastructure, or another running infrastructure that is here. So here I have um, uh, ImmediB as well, and I'm just writing into it a thousand entries. And that is not a fast system here. It's actually a system with, a, with one SSD drive, a little bit of memory, a little bit of uh, CPU. So one CPU and I think four gigabyte of memory. Um, but you see it's already fast enough 
uh, to keep up actually with a tra transitional application here. So I'm writing 10,000 entries in roughly about 15 seconds here, uh, and it's still not a batch job. It's really just a sequential write into the uh, database itself. And uh, I can monitor it um, with all kinds of uh, different software pieces. Um, so if you have a time series database, you could collect the data. Um, if you use um, all kinds of, of dashboard engines, you can of course then also uh, check for the performance of the uh, database. I'm going to give you an example here. So this one is here. So we just started actually. Session right up. So I just started here uh, the test. And in this case, you see what has been written. And you also see if the auditor is fine or not. And this auditor was exactly what I had here. So this one here says it's invalid. So I shouldn't trust the database anymore. In this case, everything is intact. In the meantime, there are uh, more than a million entries in it. And the auditor is actually checking if the database um, integrity is there. Uh, the data logic has been untempered. So it's really uh, the structure is intact. And then as an application client, I can even go one step further and check if I was the client that added or changed a certain um, key value. And a very common example uh, how EMDB is being used are log files. So going back to the system here, I have a, a very simple syslog test. So I'm just generating some log file, uh, some log data, and this log data is being sent to an external uh, syslog system. And this syslog system is automatically uh, making sure that all the syslog entries are verifiable. So I always put them into EMDB and have auditors running the check that nobody could tamper also than the syslog, uh, the log data. Uh, the syslog is now one example. This could, of course, also be an application log as well. So I'm just sending that over to that syslog service. And uh, this one here is a, a product uh, from a company called Advisor. Uh, so here's already the data coming in. Let me run some checks here. And you see that the log data is coming in, but additionally, there's also um, this little icon here. So for every single icon, uh, every single log entry, I can check if this entry can be verified and uh, if I can be sure that nobody ever tampered. Uh, or change. And you see when I click here, it automatically also turns green, so I don't need to go into this entries again. Um, but that is now a typical combination how EMDB is used. So in combination with a syslog uh, target and a syslog indexer, uh, the raw data uh, is always stored immutably. Uh, so also when it comes to audits or when you um, need to do forensics, uh, you can actually be sure that this data has not been tempered by anyone. It actually still is original. Another very common use case is um, supporting sensitive data fields in a database. So uh, in this case, I have a, a Postgres database uh, where this application is running on top of it. And I'm going to uh, add some users and some bank accounts using my application. So I'm just adding some things. And I have here a listener uh, that is automatically in real time uh, checking all the changes on all the, um, the uh, updates and uh, inserts and deletions that are being made to the Postgres. And as you can see here, there's always an index. So everything is automatically being stored in EMDB. And it's also being verified if the entry is okay or not. And you see the history of uh, the specific field with the sensitive data. In this case, it's a bank account. And what I'm going to do now is accessing the database directly. And that is a very 
common use case uh, that customers of us actually uh, uh, approached us and, and uh, told us, uh, they have the following issue. Um, the DBA could potentially access the database independent of the application. So um, they very often use things like a jump host or some other uh, system that is always being um, video recorded or there's an audit log that is being written. But the issue is always if the change happens, it doesn't mean that the change is detected. Uh, and then, of course, you also lack the history of it. And uh, there's a statistic that changes like this that could lead to a potential um, um, also damage uh, are typically detected uh, over 260 days after it happened. And then you do the forensics and then you need to walk through all the log files. So um, what uh, one customer of us actually started to do is, in addition to having the, um, the jump post, um, he has a trigger like this listener here on his database. And whenever some changes on certain fields happen, it's automatically also being sent to EMDB and stored in EMDB. So what I'm going to do now is I'm changing the bank account here. And I'm changing it from 29 to, let's say, 19. And you see here it's index three. The moment I click update, uh, there's automatically this new change is detected, independent of my application here. And when I check it out, this verification doesn't mean that actually the data is good or bad. In this case, it only means that the database content is verifiable and it, nothing has been tempered. But from the application logic, of course, my application can now double check before the wire transfer is being made, for example, if there's any history in here and um, if suddenly some changes happen that are uncommon. So then I can, of course, then um, compare the uh, different values. So you see, in this case, it was a 21 before, now it's a 19. And it was not done by my application. Somebody uh, changed it directly in the database. So I could actually um, compare my application log uh, with the EMDB and automatically uh, ask then, for example, an auditor or somebody else to double check. The um, one, one question that, uh, of course, also uh, comes up uh, quite often is um, how we actually store data, how actually the data consistency uh, check happens. And uh, there is a, a website called IMUDBIO. And uh, you can actually go, first of all, you can uh, then also go to the GitHub repository to check for the binaries. Um, but you can also go uh, to get started where you have a whole guideline. And there's also a, a how it works section. Uh, where you can find all the information, how this Merkle tree is sitting on top of um, the IMDB and how the data consistency check is being made, uh, but also how data is, for example, inserted. This is now the uh, description where I already showed it live. Um, how you can protect it. We have currently have for, um, listeners for Postgres, um, but they are also uh, currently in the making listeners for um, the MongoDB, for uh, uh, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, uh, and we are also looking into DP2 right now. And our main goal is, of course, that the application is not being changed and the database is not being changed. So we don't want to have database triggers or we don't want to have uh, application changes that send the data additionally to us using APIs. Our main goal is also to support um, existing applications without any changes or at least few changes so that the listener can connect to the database and whenever um, certain sensitive fields are being updated, we actually store the history uh, immutably. and. Um, of course, we can also store any kind of data. You can use an API, you can use our CLI tools uh, to um, actually record uh, any kind of historic data or any, time of, um, any kind of immutable data you want to store. Any questions I can answer? 
So I don't see any in the chat, but if people have questions, uh, unmute yourself or add them to the chat. Okay, Dennis, I don't see any questions at this time. Maybe also when questions come up, um, you can of course always contact us. Uh, so from the presentation and, and the demo, I'm done. So I'm actually uh, wanted to spare some time for questions. Um, I can, of course, then also give you uh, them uh, some other um, use case information. So uh, I mentioned the one with the database. I mentioned the one with the, the system logs. Uh, one thing that uh, we see more and more interest is also about application logs. Um, so we are currently in discussions uh, with a customer to uh, integrate Log4j, for example, so Java applications, that, uh, the Java um, application logging and also uh, certain events are automatically being sent uh, to MEDB. Um, we are also working on um, plugins you can use for um, send or for um, access data. Uh, so when you have uh, people accessing your Linux system, um, also all kinds of, of um, access logs for web services, firewalls. So not just the, the system log itself or a syslog, but also going more into details uh, regarding web service logs, application logs, uh, or even then very common modules for java.net and so on. Any questions for, for Dennis out there? I see some comments, you know, and I agree, very cool technology. Um, so I'm glad I got a chance to, to learn about this. All right, well, if people do have questions or things come to mind later on, as Dennis said, these contact information is available in the charts and we'll be getting them uploaded and uh, th this recording posted later uh, next week. Uh, so thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. And uh, like I said, if there are any questions also uh, in our GitHub repository, uh, you can also uh, communicate with us. So we are always happy to hear. Oh, so actually, there, was just... one, there was one quick question that came in. Um, is it new DV? Will it run under ZOS and support vSAM receive or related database? So we currently run on Linux. So actually, when you have a, a Linux running on top of the C architecture, then we actually support it. Um, and uh, I actually don't know right now about the vSAM uh, related DB. Um, can you give me some context? So I think they're thinking about vSAM databases uh, coming out of ZOS. Oh, ah, okay. So in, in general, uh, what so first of all, of course, uh, we try to support them. For example, um, up or um, a trigger. So of course, a, a trigger could could be used. Um, but I honestly need to do, uh, or we need to dig into more details uh, what capabilities the databases have, uh, because that is the main point um, always. If the database already have support for listeners, we can um, directly con uh, attach to uh, or listen to. Then it's extremely easy. Um, if uh, there's more uh, things to do, like uh, creating a driver or uh, integrating, um, for example, into uh, using triggers or even the application itself, then it's, of course, a little bit more work to do. Um, but uh, we are actually feature on customer feedback driven. That means the more customers are asking for something, the more we actually, uh, or the higher it goes into the prioritization on our roadmap. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, again, thank you, Dennis. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you very much.